I'm so happy to talk to everyone tonight about how increasing your understanding of archives can help you to better preserve your personal home records, your own personal archives. I'm a genealogist, I'm a librarian, I'm an archivist. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you with my archivist hat on, and I'm going to share some ways that we can ensure that future generations receive our personal archives as completely as possible, with as little damage, and with as much understanding as possible. As genealogists, we spend a lot of time looking for our ancestors, their vital records, and other documents, but we're also looking to connect with them and to feel like we know them in some way. So with this presentation, I want to share some ideas on how to be a good ancestor, how to collect and preserve and provide context for your records so that your future descendants, when they are researching you, have a lot of good information to work with. So what is a good ancestor? Well, a good ancestor is someone that we understand and feel like we know, and we understand them through the records that they leave behind. The photographs, the letters, journals, books, crafts, stories, but all of these records can be easily lost or damaged, or they can be preserved, but with so little associated information that we can't really fully understand them. So tonight we're going to look at what archivists do, the challenges that they face trying to preserve and contextualize archival items. And from that, we'll see how we can help future archivists and future researchers to understand us better. And we'll look at how to be a good ancestor generally, and also how to be a good genealogical ancestor. If you've done a lot of research on your family history, we'll look at ways to ensure that all your research work can be better understood and preserved in the future. So what do archivists do? Archivists collect, preserve, and provide access to documents and artifacts that illuminate local history, family history, political and social movements, daily life, things like that. That's the elevator speech. In reality, we spend a lot of time with records that have been stored in leaky basements for decades, and we try to salvage what we can and understand what it is and why it's important. So you'll hear me say collections a lot tonight. And that's a reference to all of the gathered items that one person or family or corporate entity has created. One of the big differences between a librarian and an archivist is that librarians usually deal with individual items. You can think one book at a time, for example. But archivists deal with groups of related items or collections. So along with the preservation of physical objects, a huge part of an archivist's work is maintaining context. So why was that grainy photograph important? Why was that document created? Why was it saved for all these years? And the reason, usually, is that someone believed it was important enough to hold on to, and an archivist processing a collection needs to find that reason. So all of this information about items, that's called metadata which is another term that you'll hear me say a lot tonight. And creating robust metadata is how we maintain contextual understanding of archival collections. So let's get started with the common risks to collections. So this slide image is awful. It's heartbreaking. I hate it. Most records don't look like this. This is definitely our don't image. Common risks to collections are mostly environmental, meaning the physical environment has a significant impact on how the collections will fare throughout the years. Temperature and relative humidity are important as are light levels. Pests are often a concern depending on where you live. Emergencies happen, whether they're regional emergencies like a hurricane or personal ones like a burst pipe in your house. And how items are handled, carried, touched, and packaged, these are all risky in their own way. And as I said before, loss of context, another very big risk to collections. So we're going to talk about each one of these individually, but I do want to emphasize that collections care is a balance between what is ideal versus what is doable in a consistent way. Professional archivists are rarely able to do things perfectly, and we have similar struggles with trying to meet standards at all times. So as we go through these, I'll give you a lot of information and a lot of ideas, and it's very easy to feel overwhelmed and to feel like you're currently doing everything wrong. But instead, please focus on starting somewhere 
and gradually improving. Don't focus on how high the hill is, just focus on your next step. So temperature and RH, relative humidity. Temperature is how hot or cold a room is, and relative humidity is how much moisture is in the air as a percentage. It sounds simple, but it is not. As a professional archivist, this is a very big part of what I do every day. Individual items have varying requirements, but mixed collections, which is what most of us have, meaning we have a mix of some papers, some photos, some films, some quilts. Most of these items are best at about 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 55% relative humidity. Generally speaking, the warmer a storage location is, the faster the items in it will deteriorate. So that's why we wanna keep things cooler. And the higher the relative humidity, the more likely there is to be mold growth. Mold is a significant problem. It's a health hazard. It damages objects and it spreads rapidly once it gets going. So we want to control relative humidity to avoid mold growth. Another consideration is fluctuations in temperature and relative humidity, because these can stress items and cause damage to them as well. So with moisture, Different items absorb moisture and lose moisture at different rates, and they expand and contract as these changes occur. And this expansion and contraction causes cracking and splitting and distortions. Photographs are especially at risk because they usually have a paper base and an emulsion layer that has the photo image on it. And those two layers interact with moisture differently, and they expand and contract at different rates. So over time, you can see cracking and other damage contributing to photo loss, the image loss. And then the paper and emulsion eventually will begin to separate from each other as well. So what can you do? Well, archivists monitor environmental conditions with things called data loggers, but that's not practical in a home environment. Instead, you know your home, so you want to choose a storage space for your records that is environmentally stable. Avoid attics because they usually are too hot and too dry. Avoid basements because they usually have too much moisture. And avoid a garage or a shed that usually has no environmental controls at all. In your home, choose a storage space that's not against an exterior wall because interior walls usually have more stability environmentally, hopefully structurally too. And so choose them for storage when you can. And if you have air conditioning, that's even better but many of us don't have that. And so we still have to find a place to store our, our, our records. And you also wanna consider microclimates. So if you have a plastic bin with the lid on tight, it will usually have a temperature and an RH inside the bin that's different from the one outside in the rest of the room. And it's usually going to be warmer and more moist. So you could have a mold bloom within a box because of a microclimate. So don't seal things up unless you really have to, just let them breathe. So light is another important issue and it's an often overlooked one, but it's a very important one because the damage from light cannot be undone. Light damage is both irreversible and cumulative. It can cause papers to darken and it can fade inks, dyes, and pigments. You've probably seen this on your curtains at home or when you flip the cushions on a couch and see how much darker the fabric used to be. Well, that's going to happen to your photos and your papers as well. So think of light sources when you're hanging anything on your walls and limit the amount of direct sunlight that those items will encounter. So really you don't wanna hang anything on a wall directly opposite a window or you don't wanna hang an original item. Frame items with museum quality glass because that will block some of the ultraviolet light and consider switching your house over to LED light bulbs because LED light bulbs don't emit ultraviolet or infrared light. And then also consider displaying copies of fragile photos or fragile documents instead of displaying the originals. So that way all the light damage happens to a copy that can be replaced and not to the original that is unique. Okay, pests. No matter where you live, the pests will vary depending on, on your, you know, your, where, where you live in the country. I put a picture of mice on this slide, mostly because I didn't want to look at a picture of cockroaches, but both are problematic. In most areas, mice 
roaches, and silverfish will do the most damage to your collections. They are happy to eat your boxes and your papers. They leave their droppings on your valuable records, and they scare you when you disturb their resting place. So the best way to avoid pests is to avoid inviting them in. You do this by emphasizing cleanliness. So if you ever visit an archive, they usually don't allow food and drinks in the reading room, and pests is one of the reasons why. You wanna take your trash out frequently and don't store open containers of food in your pantry, because again, these will attract pests who will want to eat that. And then once they're in, then they're in. And clean up any spills quickly because a sticky spot again is going to attract pests. If you're in an old house like I am, you wanna work with someone to block those teeny tiny holes that mice can use to get into your house. And you wanna take a look at your plants as well because plants can have pests in them. So keep them out of the rooms where you have your most important records. And again, pull the leaves that are dying and, and keep them clean. If you work with a pest management company, let them know that you have important records in your house. Chemical extermination can be very effective, but it can leave fumes and residue that can damage your archives. So talk to your professional about what's best for your situation. Now, emergencies, you can't plan for them. That's why they're an emergency, but you can prepare for one. So one thing to keep in mind is emergencies are going to happen. This is it's a fact of life. So the best way to be ready is to think of your worst case scenario and then arrange things so that the worst case is a little less bad. Water or fire are going to be your likeliest emergencies in a home, whether it's a burst pipe or a leaking water heater. Water is, is actually the biggest, the biggest issue or the biggest likely problem. So if you can, store your boxes at least three inches off the floor and that will help preserve them if there is a small flood. Plastic bins can protect from water, but again, like I said earlier, they can introduce microclimates. So it's important to evaluate your situation and balance the risks. If you can only store your records in, a, a, in your basement, then maybe you want that bottom layer of boxes to be plastic so that if there's a flood, then, then they're protected. You just, it's just, you have to evaluate your situation and do the best that you can. For particularly important items, you want to consider storing them offsite. A safe deposit box can really give you a lot of peace of mind so that then you know that the, your items that can't be replaced are safe. And in an emergency where you need to evacuate, you want to know where your essential records are, like a birth record or a passport, so that you can take those and go. And now I've saved the best for last for the risk section because improper handling is the way that most objects are damaged. And this includes with professional archivists. All the other ones that I've mentioned are risks, of course, but improper handling is the most likely way something will be damaged. So every time something is handled, touched, moved, or displayed, there is a risk for damage or loss, and there is a guarantee of wear and tear. Most damage is done with good intentions. You may tape that paper together to keep it together, not realizing that the adhesive residue is going to stain the paper and damage the paper. Or you might remove a photo from an old frame thinking it's better off in a folder so that it doesn't get light damage anymore, but the emulsion layer may have adhered to the glass and it gets torn and lost as it's removed from the frame. Or you might have something that's been rolled into a tube for years and you wanna flatten that out, but it cracks and tears from the strain of being flattened too quickly. So as you're working with your own personal papers, tread carefully and go slowly. Don't force things that are giving you resistance because they're trying to tell you that they can't move that way for a reason. Another thing to avoid is holding things together with paper clips or staples because any metal will rust and damage the paper over time. And remember, an archivist is always thinking not just one or two years, we're always thinking 50, 100 years. Use sturdy boxes when you stack things, when you box things so that they don't collapse onto each other. And also don't move boxes alone because you could drop one and damage the things in them. And more importantly, you could hurt yourself. Archivists never retrieve boxes alone for this reason, and you shouldn't either. So our image for this slide is an example of what we should do when we're retrieving and putting away boxes. Get a friend, have some help. When you're handling items, use clean and dry hands. 
It seems obvious, but it often needs to be said, even in a professional archive. So if you're cleaning out a closet and you take a break for lunch, wash up before you go back to going through photos and papers. Even small crumbs will attract pests and oils on your hands will transfer to everything that you touch. And speaking of oils on hands, there is the great glove debate. Do we need gloves when handling archival materials? Recommendations for this have changed over the years and they may change again. But the current wisdom is no gloves and yes, wear gloves for anything photo related, slides, negatives, prints. Cotton gloves, they're a lovely relic, I love them, but things can very easily slip out of your hands with them. So the best gloves are nitrile gloves that you can get at any drugstore. They're much more grippy than cotton. And so use them when you're working with photo related items because fingerprints can transfer very easily to either the negative or to the emulsion layer. But clean dry hands are best for books and papers because dexterity, enough dexterity is lost when you're wearing gloves that you're actually more likely to crumple or tear a page as you turn it with gloves on. Again, overall, you need to use your best judgment. If a leather bound book has deteriorated and red rot is staining your hands, wear gloves with that book so that you don't transfer that stain to other things that you touch. The best approach when handling archival items is to move carefully and thoughtfully so that there are not accidental spills, drops, or breakages. If you take your time and don't rush and think things through, your risks will be much lower. I have just shared a lot of information with you. This is the point where I want us all to take a breath, let the muscles on your shoulders relax. Let's remind ourselves we're doing the best we can. I hope you're learning something new today and that when you know better, you can do better. Again, most professional archives have to balance limited resources with professional standards. So we have our goals, but almost no one is meet meeting them perfectly. So do what you can. Don't be upset with yourself for what's happened in the past. Identify manageable changes that you can make and take gradual steps forward. Now that we know the risks and we've taken a deep breath, Let's take a look at some of the tools you'll need to preserve your home archives. Overall, you want to emphasize items that will be sturdy and durable, but also breathable and non-reactive. So plastic photo sleeves are popular. They allow you to look through photos without damaging them with your fingerprints, but they can create microclimates. So paper sleeves. And if you have a photo that's going to be viewed often, it might be better to digitize that and look at it on a screen. And we will briefly discuss digitization later in this presentation. When shopping for supplies, remember that the term archival is a marketing term. There is no professional meaning behind it. Anyone can call anything archival and it doesn't mean very much. So instead you wanna look for products that are acid free or ideally ones that say PAT certified, which means they have passed the photographic activity test and this means that they will not react to photographic materials and they're safe to use with any materials really. When you write on things, you wanna write with a soft graphite pencil, either on the back of your photos or other items or on the slips of paper that you tuck into folders where the archival item is stored. You wanna avoid adhesives because over time they will only become unstuck, leaving behind discoloration and residue. I've had more than one situation or I've had a box full of folders with sticky labels that were printed out beautifully and arranged. And as soon as we move the box, they all just fall. And you don't know which one goes with which folder. You also want to avoid metals, like I said, paper clips and staples especially, because they will rust and, and tear and cause damage. When storing items, fill your folders and boxes, but don't overstuff them. So a box that has too few folders, the folders will sag and curve, and then the contents in them will match that curve. But on the other side of that, an overstuffed box will be, it will be very difficult to get things out of the box and you're more likely to tear or damage things. So one item per folder is overkill, not necessary for most items, but an over full folder is easy to drop and then have everything slide out. So fill your containers, but don't stuff them. Moderation is best. So now that we know how best to store our personal archives, let's consider how to tell a good story with them. 
So when we do our own genealogical research, we rarely stop at birth, marriage, and death dates. We don't just want the bare facts and an outline of our ancestors' lives. We want to know their story. What did they do for work? Where did they live? What language did they speak? How did they spend their leisure time? What causes did they work for? These details help us to feel connected to our ancestors, especially when we have talents and interests in common with them. Details are at the heart of a great story. So as a good ancestor, you can provide your descendants with the meaningful details that will allow them to know and understand you better. And meaningful has an asterisk there because it's a relative term. Shopping lists and other ephemera are fantastic ways to show your descendants who you were. All of this together is called preserving context. And there are several ways that we can do this. Keeping a diary is an excellent way to communicate the daily details of your life to your descendants. And this can be a traditional Dear Diary book, Dear Diary, this is what I did today, where you write your thoughts and your ideas. Maybe you keep a dream journal, or this can be your written planner of the work that you do each day. It may seem boring and mundane, but it really is very interesting. The way you spend your time each day is a very strong statement on what you value and where your priorities are and your descendants want to know this. There are some diary adjacent items too. Your holiday card list shows who is important enough for you to keep in touch with even just once a year. Your family calendars show more details about your household lifestyle. Who was taking piano lessons and when? Which soccer league did Aunt Mary play for? Who usually cooked supper on Tuesday nights? Again, it seems ordinary, but these are the details that are very compelling and bring research alive and handwritten recipe books. Few things are better than seeing your favorite recipe from childhood in your grandmother's handwriting and stained with the years of her use. On this slide, I've included a calendar page from a scientific archival collection at the University of Pittsburgh. You can see that there are short notes for each day, and it looks like it was quickly done and probably not written with the intention of lasting for many years. But for the right researcher, this is a very insightful treasure. If you shy away from writing your own books, your own journals, then at least write in your books. As a librarian, I am giving you permission to write in the books that you own. Many people don't want to write in their books feeling that they're too special, but underlining and highlighting and reacting to the text in the margins of the page turn a book into a debate on ideas and your descendants want to hear your side of the debate. At a minimum, write your name in your books. Maybe add the purchase date and the location too because that puts you in a place in time and that's valuable. Ideally, interact with your books robustly and they will be treasured by descendants who will hear your side of the story as they read along too. This slide's image is of Bess Truman, a former first lady writing in a book. You can see from the caption, which we'll get to next, that much of the context of this image has been lost. The two women standing are unidentified and the event, date and location are unknown. I'll be talking about photo context in a moment, but this image here is just to encourage you to write in your books. So losing context with photographs is incredibly easy to do. Most of us have at least one box of photos of people that we couldn't name at all. We can maybe place them in a decade based on their clothes or their hairstyles. Maybe we recognize a grandparent, but most of the context is lost. Even though to the contemporaries of that photo, these were events worth photographing, and photographs worth keeping. These were your grandparents' close friends, but just a few years later, we don't know who they are or what the connections are. So if you're going to spend time improving your personal collections, I would definitely recommend spending a lot of time with your photographs, and it will take a lot of time. Creating contextual information is time consuming, but it is well worth the effort. You don't want all your future captions to be unknown people at an undocumented event. And I can assure you, I have processed many photo collections where that was the caption that we had to use. On this slide, I have two photos that will help us illustrate this. These are two photographs from the archives of Vizcaya Museum and Gardens, which is a delightful historic house museum in Miami, Florida. I had the pleasure of being their archivist for four years and I processed these photographs. So as I criticize these captions, I'm only criticizing myself. 
On the left is a photo of a woman and a child from the William Dunn Sturrock collection. The caption says, woman in a dark jacket holds an infant. I think that they are William's wife and daughter, but I'm not sure, so I couldn't write that in the caption. I know when the photos were taken based on the architecture of the building and when Mr. Stark worked at Vizcaya, but otherwise, there's no other available context for this photo. And on the right is a photo from the Abby Deering Howe photo collection. We know more about Abby because her brother James was the owner of Vizcaya, but we have no idea who the other person in the photo is. The caption reads Abby Deering Howe and unknown person because that's all we know. We can guess the year of the photo based on Abby's presumed age, but that's it. Abby didn't have a sister, so this is not her sister. And the pose suggested a very close friend, but unfortunately that information has just been lost. So when you're captioning your photos, think of how they will be read in the future. A caption of me and mom is meaningful to you right now, but it will have less meaning in 20 years or 50 years. Use full names, even though it feels awkward to refer to yourself that way. So I might caption a photo instead of saying me and mom, I might say Karen Urbeck and Patricia Sheehan, mom. That's a caption that will last longer and it will be understood by people outside the family. And it gives the genealogical link of mother and child. So it's valuable that way too. If you can add a date and a location to your photo ca captions, that's even better. And adding an occasion is best of all. So me and mom can become Karen Urbeck and Patricia Sheehan, mom, at Karen's library school graduation. And now we have a lot of information. You not only have better information about that one photo, you have a parent-child link, and now you also have new avenues for research. You can look for school records. You can look for professional records or scholarly publications. So a good caption can illuminate many aspects of your research, not just the photo itself. Often when we look at archives, we consider them as written or textual items. We think of books and papers, photos. These are the easiest to store and to understand. But writing and literacy are privileged abilities, and there are many non-textual items that can teach us about an ancestor. Children don't often leave journals and letters, but they leave artwork that is valuable. Busy people may not keep their journals up to date, but they spend their time quilting or knitting, woodworking or painting, and they are creating valuable artifacts that allow us to know them better. So on this slide, we can see a scrapbook from about 1900 with cards and ribbons and other ephemera pasted on. There's a handwritten recipe book from 1707, and there's an 1890s quilt top. So all of these items tell us important and meaningful details about what was important to the creators, how they spent their time, and what they believed was important enough to save. You have items in your home like this that tell a similar story about yourself. So be sure to include non-textual items when thinking of your own personal records. And in our final context slide, I have a plea to remember the ladies. Abigail Adams famously wrote this to her husband in the 1700s, and she is on this slide to remind us that stories often do not enter the historic record as often as men's stories do. We've all seen plenty of old documents for John Wheeler and wife, and then we spend hours trying to find out Mrs. Wheeler's first and maiden names. In this slide, it's a little hard to read, but I've included a detail of my great-grandmother, Sarah Fessenden's birth record, which lists her parents only by their first names. Our parents were named Isaac and Elizabeth, and this record actually says Isaac and Lizzie, which is a further complication. It's already very hard to trace our women ancestors, so please remember the ladies when you are creating contextual information for your records. Use full names, use maiden names, use legal names alongside nicknames so that the women in your life can be found in the future as easily as the men. Another topic that I want to briefly mention, though it is a very big and complicated topic, is digital records. Digital records are very common now, which would make you think that they're easy, but they are actually quite difficult and expensive to maintain properly, and context is also very easy to lose. But first, the preservation basics. For all digital items, whether they are born digital or they are a scanned analog record, which archivists call digital surrogates, 
Backups are essential. One digital copy is not enough because files become corrupted, computers glitch, and if there's only one copy, you may find that you can't open it. And then what do you do? So keeping several copies will protect you from digital loss. The archival standard is known as 321, which means three complete copies of everything, two different media types, and one with geographic diversity. So how to do this? If you have one copy on your computer, one on an external hard drive, and one in cloud storage, you meet this standard. But this represents more digital storage than most people expect, and storage can be expensive. Digital migration is essential as well. How many of us have important records that we burnt to CDs, but now we have laptops with no CD drive? Your external hard drive will become obsolete as well. So you need to plan for it and migrate the data before you can't access it. Again, I could do an entire presentation on this topic, but this is a starting point. So when you consider digitizing your records, look at the pros and cons before you begin. For the pros, it's very easy to share your records digitally, and it doesn't damage the originals to look at images on a screen, and those are very good things. But the cons are, now you have two things to keep track of. You scanned this photo, you're not gonna throw it away after you scan it. So now you have two things, the original and the digital surrogate. You've just doubled your workload. And maintenance is an ongoing part of the process. So when you finish digitizing things, you can't think of it as a job that's complete because the digital preservation job just started. Context is another one that is very difficult to maintain with digital items, digitized items. I like to use the example of a book. We know that the pages of a book go together and we know what comes first and what follows after just by holding it in our hands. It's obvious the order that it is natural. But when you scan those pages, each page becomes its own distinct item. And so without good metadata, it's very easy to lose the understanding of the cohesive original. So be extra careful to describe works that you digitize so that you can maintain that integrity. So I don't wanna be a complete downer. Digitization is a great tool, but I want you to go into it with open eyes and to understand what you're taking on. So finally, how to be a good genealogical ancestor. You've probably been researching for years. You probably have notes and records in various states of completion. Maybe you think of yourself as a hobbyist, or maybe you think of yourself further down the road than that. If you think of yourself as a hobbyist, maybe you think that no one else is interested in your notes. But the truth is, you have learned a lot in your research, and your research is very valuable. Any descendant who has an interest in genealogy, or even any genealogical researcher, will be very happy to learn of your findings, your hunches, your brick walls. So don't sell yourself short. Make sure that you spend some of your research time on organization so that others can benefit from your work. And I would also encourage you very strongly to publish what you have found and donate it to your public library. Where I work, I have several shelves of local genealogies and they're incredibly valuable. And some of them are beautifully bound, professionally published volumes. Some are handwritten notes, photocopies and printouts that are in three ring binders but they are all very valuable hyper-local resources that illuminate the region and the families who lived here. When you share your research with your local public library, you can provide the same illumination to your community. So I encourage you to preserve your work by sharing it with your local history librarian, because even unfinished works are extremely valuable and they give a future researcher a starting point of good information instead of just starting with a blank page. So this slide image is a page of notes from the Kirby family genealogy at Ball State University. So unfinished does not mean unvalued. It just means that there's more work to be done by future researchers. So again, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you about archives and how understanding archives can improve your genealogical journey. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My contact information is listed here and I welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, there are questions. I hope you're ready. Okay. I'm, I'm trying. 
<laughs> the first one I can answer, um, it's, will I be able to see the recording later? And the answer is yes. Uh, Karen has graciously allowed us mm -hmm. to record and this will go onto our YouTube page at a later date. So keep an eye out for that. And then the next question is, can you talk a bit about the implications of scanning items, documents, and photos? I'm wondering how the exposure to intense light during that process and how damaging that could be to the original. Any do's and don'ts? Um, that's actually, that's a very insightful question. Um, when you scan something, you do expose it to a high amount of light, but the general feeling is that if you scan it, then you're going to put it away. It's going to be in a in a paper enclosure, in a folder, and it won't be taken out too many times because you'll have that digital surrogate to refer to. So there is a risk of light damage, but you now have completely removed the wear and tear risk. And that's usually considered a, a good payoff. Hello, any suggestions on removing photos from old magnetic photo albums? <laughs> My mother used them and the photos have become stuck to the backing and in some cases to the clear film material. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, those, yeah, those were, were very popular albums and, and we thought that they were good because you could cover them with plastic and they would be protected. Um, unfortunately, that adhesive is, um, can really be difficult. Um, a lot of times if it's a, if it's a high volume of photos, you may want to consult with a paper conservator or a photo conservator. Um, there are different solvents that you can use that can remove the, the adhesive. Um, that's not something that I typically do in my work, so I can't really guide you towards any products, but, um, but a photo conservator can, can help you. What is PAT certified? PAT certified means the photographic activity test. And so what that is, is that they take items that are designed for use with archival items and they, um, I don't exactly know what they do, honestly, um, but what it does is it shows that they are non-reactive when coming in contact with the different chemicals that are related with photographic items. And they, since they don't react, they won't discolor things, they won't fade things, they won't change things. And so, uh, so PAT certified items are, um, that's really the archival standard. How to caption an old photo? Is it okay to write on the back in pencil? What else can be used? Yep, absolutely write on the back in pencil. Um, a soft graphite pencil is going to be your best bet because it will uh, it will write, but it won't leave an impression. It, you know, it won't like crease anything. Um, an another option is if you have uh, paper photo sleeves, you can write your caption on the sleeve and then put the photo in. And then that way, when you look at the sleeve, you know what is, you know, what's inside of it. This person says they have a eight by 10 tin type of their two times great grandmother. I know it is her. What is the best way to attach the identity of the person to the back of the tin type? Um, I wouldn't try to attach anything to a tin type. Um, I would, I would, keep, I would put that in a folder by itself. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. for sure. And then you can have a, a piece of paper in with, with pencil writing, uh, what is with that? Yeah. I, I would not try to attach anything to type. What is the best way to preserve photos that were glued down in a scrapbook? Yeah. Scrapbooks are difficult. Um, especially if it's the, one of those old scrapbooks with the, like the dark, like cardboardy paper that really crumbles. Um, honestly, I found that if, that's what I have to work with and, and it's already falling apart, it might be better to very carefully take an X-Acto knife and cut out the uh, the scrapbook backing. It will still be on the back, um, but at least then the photos are separate and can be folded or, or, or put in paper. This person actually has their grandmother's photo album that has those old black pages that are disintegrating. Mm -hmm. They want to know if they should take the photos, should they take photos of the pages and move the photos to a new album? Um, well, there's a couple things going on there. So you want the images of the, the photos that were mounted, but then you also probably want to preserve the arrangement that your grandmother made. So taking a photo of the entire page is a great idea because mm -hmm. then you have an image of how she created it then you can take the photos and, 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 you know, 
put the photos in a different folder or put the photos away in another way. This person says that they assume from your comments that archives would prefer to have items in paper rather than digital if there's a choice to be made, correct? Um, I would say that you will get a different point of view from a different from different archivists. Um, I have worked with a lot of older documents and photos, and so uh, that's what I'm, I'm more accustomed to. If you're a digital archivist, obviously you're going to have a stronger digital opinion. Um, I'm not against digitization, not at all, because it's a wonderful way to share media and share images and share letters and share things. Uh, whether it's emailing it to someone or whether it's having it on your website or however you choose to do that. So digitization is very meaningful and impactful and important. Um, but usually professional archivists are writing pretty sizable grants in order to take on a digitization project. And there are long-term expenses associated with digital storage and maintenance and migrations and IT and all of that. So from a home digitization standpoint, um, I just want you to know that it's it's a bigger it's bigger than just scanning them and that being done. So does pencil not fade over time? Uh -huh. um, pencil can fade over time, absolutely. But if you spill your coffee on it, it won't run like it like ink will, or water or something like that. So if you have something that's water damaged, any inks will usually spread and and be lost. Uh, but pencil won't. So. And you also, um, if you are working with archives and working with a pencil, working with a pen, you can, you know, you can get a stray mark on something. And if it's a stray mark with a pencil, you can erase it. Um, so, yeah, but they, but of course, yes, anything exposed to light will fade over time. Can you speak on lignin free? Yes. So lignin free is what you will see for uh, papers. Um, lignin is something that is naturally occurring in most modern papers, and that is what deteriorates and, and exudes acid as it deteriorates. So if you can get lignin-free papers, then those will be more archivally appropriate uh, for use. Yes. I wanted to give you just one more opportunity to talk about your business very quickly before we go. Oh, well, um, you, I hope, have my website, uh, New England Genealogy Associates. And so I'm available for genealogical research and also archival consulting. So I, I, I welcome anyone reaching out to me. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And hopefully we will see you on Tuesday evening for our special program and for the rest of Family History Month. So have a wonderful rest of your evening and goodbye, everyone.